introduce our final speaker. Uh, when the students at DeVest Harvard asked if I might assemble a few alumni to help out, the very first um, email I wrote was to Cornell West. And I was so glad that he was the very first person to write back and that he was able to come today at the end of this week. And that's for two reasons, okay? The first reason is, by this point in the week, we are pretty sh I, I look pretty bad, and you guys look almost as bad, okay? Um, we are a fairly shabby-looking bunch after all these nights in the shrubbery and on the floor of the Alumni Association. You tell the Alumni Association that they need better carpeting in the future, okay? Um, um, and I knew, I knew that whenever he came, Cornell West would provide a burst of splendor when he arrived that he would charge us up in every way and that he would look just what we would need. The second reason, the deep reason, is because he exemplifies what this week has been about. You remember those of you who were there Sunday night that we ended with Jabril Kazan, one of the original Greensboro Four who had sat in at that lunch counter and it was a um, reach back into our prophetic history. And you know that that's been a theme all we, you know what privilege we've had this week. I mean, last night when we were here, we had our great sister Naomi Klein on hand taking a moment from all the struggles that she's helping with around the world. And now, this morning, we have, as we near the end, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go over, and I guess in, in that same unnerving silence with which we uh, greeted President Faust the other day, take a little maybe trip in that, but before we're silent, we need some prophecy, we need some witness, and there is no one who has been a more faithful, prophetic witness at Harvard or at any place else for decades in this country than Cornell West. I'm not going to read you his resume. I'm just going to tell you that he is a prophet and that we are so, so lucky to be blessed with his appearance here today. Thank you, brother. So much. Blessing to be here, Harvard University. Want to salute my dear brother Bill McGibbon. He's one of the long distance freedom fighters. He's a great public intellectual, and he's still on fire because it's a beautiful thing to be on fire for justice. Is that right? Is it a brilliant? Oh, yes, and Sister Naima, oh, to say her name brings back the spirit of John Coltrane, and I am here in the spirit of the love supreme of John Coltrane, and Curtis Mayfield, and Nina Simone, and others. Why do I say that? I say that because we want to tell our dear sister, Drew Faust, you were on the right side of history in dealing with white supremacist catastrophe called Selma in 1965. We understand that, but we now have a planetary Selma. 50 years later, we want you on the same right side. Oh yeah! 50 years later, we want you to have something a great Jane Austen called constancy, which is moral consistency. That's what Harvard is all about at its best. Because ecological catastrophe is as evil as white supremacist catastrophe, male supremacist catastrophe, anti-Jewish catastrophe, anti-Arab catastrophe, anti-Muslim catastrophe, anti-gay, anti-lesbian, anti-bisexual, anti-transsexual. We're talking about how do you keep track of undeserved suffering? We are here. I know I'm here because I want to be on the love train. <laughs> school. I'm old school. 
I like to talk about love because justice is what love looks like in public. Just like tenderness is what love feels like in private, but I won't go into that right now. My dear sister, I love your sign. We want very toss. Yes, look at that sign. We want very toss. Oh, my dear brother Tim McCarthy knows what I'm talking about. Because the condition of true very toss is to allow suffering to speak. The condition of truth was to allow suffering to speak. If you don't allow for the voices to be lifted, you all know I come from a blues people. And the anthem of a blues people, of black people, is what lift every voice. Doesn't say lift every echo. No, Harvard producing too many smart folk concerned with money and just generating copies and echoes. I like the voices. Those who attempt to be original enough, like Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson. When I was in Emerson Hall, I was taught by the great John Rawls and Hillary Putnam and Israel Scheffler and Robert Nozick to think for myself. Be like Socrates. Socrates was a top host. Couldn't classify him. He was an original. Well, you know what? We've now got a wave of marvelous moral militancy among the younger generation here. The students here at Harvard of all colors because they want to be on the truth train and the love train. They want the voices to be heard. That's why they're calling for transparency of the $36 billion. We want to know where the money's going. We want accountability. We want answerability. We want responsibility. You know why? Because we fundamentally believe in democracy. We believe that the voices ought to be heard at the highest level so at least we can make choices based on information that's widely available across the board. And that's a long history. My dear brother Macy laid it out. I know 1972, we took over this building too. Yeah. And it had right. Gofoy on Angola. Derek Bach, he was very smooth. I love my brother. He was very improvisational. <laughs> he invited us in. He was flexible. He was fluid. But we still put the pressure on. Now keep in mind now, it was not personal because each and every one of these presidents are dealing with structural constraints. They got a board. They got strong forces, money, interest. Most of them 1%. We don't hate the 1%. We hate greed. We hate avarice. We hate moral constipation. <laughs> And most people, when they have so much money and so much power, even when they know what's right, it doesn't flow because that greed gets in the way. We want some laxatives to set in. Let the good flow. Let the right flow. Do the right thing. But this is a, a movement that has to be connected. You all know we just shut down the Brooklyn Bridge this week in New York. We didn't shut it down out of hatred of anybody. We, we shut it down out of a hatred of injustice. And it had to do with arbitrary police power. Just like arbitrary patriarchal power. Just like arbitrary homophobic power. Just like arbitrary corporate power. Democracy is fundamentally an attempt. It's a grand social experiment to curtail arbitrary power so that those Sly Stone Call everyday people can live lives of decency and dignity. And I'm here, we are here to call Harvard to divest because we see arbitrary power deployed by major institutions that are going to lead toward the destruction of the planet. It doesn't get more fundamental than that. It doesn't get more basic than that. But we've got to be able to come together and stick together and allow our overlap. We don't need wholesale agreement. 
No, leave that for the military band. I'm a jazz man. I like Duke, Ar Duke Ellington's orchestra. I like Count Basie's orchestra. I like Mary Lou Williams on the piano. Yes, I like Steve Kuhn, Harvard class of 1960, who played the piano in the John Coltrane Quartet for three months. Harvard needs to know that Coltrane connection, you know. Yeah, he was a white brother playing with Coltrane with a Harvard stamp. Yes, that's part of our tradition too, which means we lift our voices and come together, we stick together, even if we might have a disagreement here or there, we open about it, but in the end, we put collective pressure to bear. We thank Sister Chloe and they, uh, they Brother Adam and the others for coming together. I'm just glad to be a small part of this wave of activism. After 45 years, when I stepped foot in this yard, my father told me then, I'm not gonna be impressed by just the grades that you get. I wanna know what kind of human being you're gonna be. That's what my father told me. Oh yes, and I wanna be faithful unto death, to integrity, honesty, dignity, a sense of virtue in working with other brothers and sisters of all colors and cultures and sexual orientations and civilizations because we are this species on this planet. And if we don't have vision and courage, then our children and our children's children will look back and say, what happened? And we say, no, we know what side we are on now to ensure that we can smile from the grave the way W.E.B. Du Bois, this very moment, class of 1890, he smiles from the grave when he sees young folk coming together in this way. Diverse Harvard, diverse Harvard, diverse Harvard.